Good afternoon, everyone. Could, could folks please take your seats? I'd like to get the committee started. We do not yet have a quorum, but we do have a lot to cover today. And in fairness to the people who are here and, and ready to give their testimony, I, I, I know members will be getting in the room soon. Um, just so people understand, this is the time of year when members get pulled in a lot of different directions. So uh, no one who's watching should think that members aren't here because they're just you know lazy or having a long lunch or something. They're usually yeah, in yeah. other places and multitasking. And um, so I just want to understand, let people understand that. But I am calling to order the Health and Human Services Finance Division. We have presentation today from the Department of Human Services. Um, and um, just to sort of orient everybody, first of all, members um, have our budget books now complete with the change pages from the Department of Human Services as well as the uh, Department of Health the whole thing, and, and the uh, other, other uh, accounts that are under our jurisdiction in this committee. So everything is here. And I would really like to thank Ms. Niedernhofer and on our pages who've really given us a lot of assistance. It's uh, really wonderful. Thank you very much for that. I had told Ms. Niedernhofer, just give members the pages and let them put it in the binder. And she said, no, that wasn't good enough. So we can all thank her for doing that work for us and the pages who did a significant amount of work to get this done. So thank you, everybody, for that. Um, so um, we, we still don't have a quorum. Okay, so we'll move the minutes when we do get a quorum. But I would like to invite Commissioner Laurie is going to start us off here. And members, as we've been doing, Commissioner Laurie is just going to give us a little introduction. He needs to um, get on with other things after that. So. He's not going to really be taking questions today, just today. He's, he will, in the future, make himself available. But we are going to have a presentation from the department, and we're going to try to proceed as we have been. I think it's been working fairly well with members holding your questions until the end of each section, unless, of course, you have a question that is stopping you from understanding what's being said, like, what is that acronym, or I can't understand the caption on that chart, or something like that. So. With that in mind, um, Representative, or sorry, Commissioner Lori, we all do it right, and it wasn't even representative I, either. But Commissioner Lori, welcome to the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. I uh, I always say I get called a lot of things, and probably representative is not anywhere near the worst. Uh, so, <laughs> Senator, neither. Um, Commissioner neither, but uh, I am I, I am uh, DHS Commissioner Tony Lori. Uh, my second time before your committee. I did a brief introduction a couple of weeks ago, and I am just uh, really excited to be here with uh, the Walls Flanagan One Minnesota Budget. And I, it is my intent to, as the chair said, uh, go over some really pretty high level uh, summary of what you'll find in the budget, and then I'll turn it over to some of the staff. But I do want to reiterate uh, what uh, Chair Liebling said, that I, I do want myself and our entire staff uh, to be available to the House as you work through um, what you guys decide to send into conference committee uh, based on your conversations with the people of Minnesota. We'll offer technical assistance. We'll try to help you understand what's in the governor's proposed budget. We'll try to be responsive to concerns that you have and uh, work in a, in a really collaborative fashion. And I want to make that offer in, 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 in sincerity that I will also make myself available um, to members uh, too to have conversations about um, concerns, ideas, how to improve, and, and what you guys might decide um, you're going to work on. So with that, I'll jump right in. We, I have a few slides to cover. And, uh, you know, really the entirety of the Governor Wall's uh, budget for One Minnesota for Human Services in, is in support of our mission, which you'll see here, which is to help people meet their basic needs so that they can live in dignity and achieve their highest potential. The governor's proposed budget invests in and strengthens the core services that touch the lives of more than one million Minnesotans every day. The very young whose families receive help paying for child care, the very old who are better able to live in the community with the help of DHS funded services and supports, and the most vulnerable people with disabilities who rely on us for care. 
that provides opportunity for every Minnesotan, no matter if they live in metro or greater Minnesota communities, to create a brighter future for themselves, their families, and their loved ones. The budget for One Minnesota includes proposals that do many things, establish affordable and accessible health care options focused on quality uh, and improved health. It invests in the children and families across our state. It promotes a system of accessible behavioral health services. It protects the rights of vulnerable adults. It reforms the long-term care service and supports and promotes system modernization and program integrity across all of the services that we provide. And you'll hear about proposals in these areas in detail from our leadership team in just a few moments, but first I'd like to give you a very high level overview. No, and I'm, I didn't click through the slides as I was going. Somebody should throw something at me. Um, I, I'm a talker, I, I just, you know, uh, so, so work with me here. So um, One Minnesota starts with better health outcomes and broader access to care for, again, people, families and communities across Minnesota and we at DHS are proud to be a part of making that happen. While Minnesota is consistently ranked as one of the highest states and health uh, and healthiest states in the nation, we also experience some of the worst disparities and this is absolutely unacceptable. The budget for one Minnesota is, uh, and we talked about this a lot in the cabinet, it is not just a fiscal document, it is a moral document. And so with that understanding, this budget invests in partnering with and empowering our tribal nations, promoting economic stability for families, investing in child care for low-income families, closing gaps in health care coverage, and tackling the opioid epidemic, as well as many other initiatives. All of this takes aim at reducing some of the largest disparities in our state and at DHS those disparities that prevent Minnesota from achieving truly equitable outcomes in our human service programs. I'll start with uh, the One Care Minnesota package. Every Minnesotan deserves access to affordable, comprehensive options for health care, but too few have these options. Many have been priced out of health coverage and live just one injury away from, uh, one injury or illness away from bankruptcy. People are faced with impossible choices between filling prescriptions, paying for rent, or putting food on the table. Far too many men people go without dental care. <laughs> All right, here's, you, here's the spitwad that's thrown at me. We're, we're, gonna, we're gonna go through the slides as we're intended. Uh, so far too many people go without dental care for years because they don't have dental coverage, can't get an appointment, or have to travel too far to see a dentist. Governor Walz's budget includes a package called One Care Minnesota that offers a multi-pronged, measured approach to give people more access to comprehensive coverage, stabilize the individual market, address rising health care costs, and improve access to care and the health care experience for all Minnesotans. The proposal leverages the state's purchasing power to negotiate better prices for prescription drugs, which are currently driving up health care spending, it also addresses oral health disparities across the state, especially in greater Minnesota. One Care Minnesota will require 17.6 million in the, in, uh, the 20 to 23 uh, period for startup costs, but it will pay for itself starting in plan year 2023. In addition, 112 million from the Health Care Access Fund will create a reserve account to support cash flow coverage and claims and liabilities. The budget also includes repeal of the provider tax as allowing that sunset would threaten the financial stability of health care for more than one million Minnesotans served by medical assistance in Minnesota Care today. Requiring these programs to compete with other programs for general fund dollars would create uncertainty and instability. By repealing the sunset, we will maintain revenue from a long-standing stable source to support the health care of Minnesotans. Governor Walz's proposal also would preserve increased payment rates for providers serving MA and Minnesota care enrollees, offsetting the cost of the tax for those populations. This proposal would generate $992 million in revenue to the Health Care Access Fund in the 20 to 21 biennium. The, the next initiative is child care investments and integrity, and this is actually several initiatives in this, in this area. The budget for One Minnesota includes investments and integrity measures aimed at the CCAP program, child care assistance program. High quality, affordable child care is essential for children's physical, social, and emotional development. 
Children who participate in high quality early care and education are more likely to have school success and positive lifelong outcomes. Governor Walls is proposing investments in CCAP that would raise maximum rates, update eligibility rules, prioritize homeless families, and offer expanded due process rights for providers. These changes bring Minnesota into compliance with federal child care development block grant, which also help our state avoid penalties. These changes require 9.4 million in 2021 and 90.6 million in 22-23 to update the maximum rates uh, paid to child care providers, plus 8.2 million in 2021 and 21 million in 22-23 to improve CCAP and comply with federal requirements. The budget also expands access to child care assistance for families on the waiting list. While the total number of families on basic sliding fee child care waiting lists has decreased in recent years, more counties are having waiting lists. In December 2018, 25 counties and tribes had waiting lists for the basic sliding fee child care, and 1,950 families were waiting. Governor Walls proposes a, an investment of $26.4 million in 2021 and $38.7 million in the tails to buy down this waiting list, providing consistent, stable care that will better prepare children for kindergarten and lets parents go to work or go to school. We know that child care provider fraud and program integrity continue to be significant concerns because fraud exploits taxpayer funds and harms families the program is intended to help. That's why Governor Walls is proposing measures to enhance record keeping requirements, clarify billing and, rec and record maintenance for all providers, fund a case tracking system for CCAP investigation activity, and more. The proposal will require 128000 in 2021 for systems changes, but is expected to generate $1.9 million in savings uh, and in 2021 and $2.5 million in savings for 2022-23. In the children and families space, again, several uh, initiatives embodied in the One Minnesota uh, uh, package. Although Minnesota ranks high overall for children's well-being, children of color and American Indian children experience a different reality due to significant, persistent, and widening disparities. More children are entering, entering Minnesota's child protection and foster care systems, increasing demand for well-trained county and tribal child welfare workers, and flexible systems that meet federal guidelines. Demand for health care services for children in these systems is growing as well. These issues are compounded by the fact that the basic cash benefit in the Minnesota Family Investment Program has not budged in more than 30 years, making it much harder for people to work their way out of poverty. A housing benefit in 2013 helped many MFIP families, but not all. Governor Walls proposes raising the cash grant by $100 a month for households in both the Minnesota Family Investment Program and in the Diversionary Work Program. The budget for One Minnesota also includes a number of measures to improve Minnesota's child welfare system. These include an expansion of the American Indian Child Welfare Initiative to Red Lake Nation and the Mille Lacs Band of Ojibwe. This is modeled after the other child welfare initiative tribes, Leech Lake and White Earth, White Earth Nation. The initiative tribes provide culturally specific services including child abuse prevention, family preservation, 24-7 child protection intake and assessment, foster care, reunification services, transfer of custody, and, custom, uh, and customary adoptions. He also proposes establishing an American Indian Family Early Intervention Grant Program for tribes in Minnesota. The governor's budget would also create a child welfare training academy and fund a study to recommend caseload guidelines for child protection workers and supervisors. It would also invest in infrastructure to implement new federal requirements in the Family First Preservation Services Act. The state will enhance support to children and families and, pre and prevent foster care placements with evidence-based mental health and substance abuse prevention and treatment services, in-home parent programs and kinship services as well. These three proposals together would invest $15 million in 2021 and $25.8 million in 22-23 in child welfare services across Minnesota. If children do enter our foster care system, we need to ensure they have access to health care. 
Most children in foster and kinship care qualify for medical assistance, but applying for and renewing coverage can lead to gaps and loss of coverage. These barriers cause some children with physical and mental health needs to go without immediate access to care. Governor Walls proposes automatic enrollment in medical assistance for all children in foster care and kinship care, whether or not they receive Title IV-E benefits, to remove those barriers, reduce disparities, improve equity, and reduce administrative burden. This would cost 360000 in 2021 and $1.8 million in the tails. <clears throat> Behavioral health is a, a real focus of the one Minnesota budget. Right now, Minnesota, Minnesota's behavioral health system provides a range of services to help people recover from mental illness and substance use disorders. However, significant gaps remain for those most in need. The opioid epidemic continues to rip through our families and our communities, and Minnesota also needs to address overall sustainability and gaps in the current system. The Walls proposal uh, has several measures to make behavioral health care more accessible and affordable, strengthening the safety net and protecting existing services. Mental health problems affect one in every five young people in Minnesota. Expanding school-linked mental health services through grants will reach about 7,500 more K-12 students with more focus on measuring and improving quality. Creating critical and sustainable funding solutions for children's mental health will offset federal funding for 11 children's mental health providers with a total of 480 beds that are at risk today. In addition, psychiatric residential treatment facilities serve children who need more intensive care for serious and complex mental health needs and other conditions, and this proposal will raise the cap from the current limit of 150 PRTF beds to 300 beds and allow more sites to come online across the state. In our current system, it's rare to get treatment for both mental illness and substance use disorder through the same program. By improving behavioral health care through certified community behavioral health clinics, CCBHCs, people can receive coordinated care to help them before they experience a crisis. With Governor Walz's proposal, CCBHCs will transition from a demonstration project to an ongoing service model with five new providers for a total of 11 becoming, uh, being able to uh, function in the CCBHC model over the next four years. The DHS budget for One Minnesota proposes $17.4 million in 2021 and $21.5 million in the tails to address the opioid epidemic through prevention and treatment. An opioid, an advisory council will provide strategic oversight of funds from the new opioid stewardship fee. In addition, screening and brief intervention and referral to treatment focuses on healthcare settings to deliver early intervention and treatment for substance use disorder. Grants to tribal nations, as well as five urban Indian communities will improve access, coordination, and referrals for culturally specific services in the opioid space. Currently, regulations for mental health services are complex and confusing with multiple requirements in state law, rules, and other authorities, some regulations dating back as far as the 1950s. By clarifying and simplifying regulatory requirements for mental health programs, the state will align standards for services, eliminate unnecessary requirements, and repeal outdated administrative rules for outpatient mental health services. In Minnesota, the mental health and substance use disorder treatment systems continue to operate largely in silos and often in isolation from the broader continuum of health care. This is due in large part to differences between how the two systems are financed. Changes proposed in the Walls budget include aligning billing and payment for substance use disorder and mental health treatment, eliminating the county share for substance use disorder services provided through medical assistance, and providing up to three months of the housing support program for those leaving residential mental health or substance use disorder treatment. In addition, the transition to com community initiative reduces the time that individuals remain at the Anoka Re Metro Regional Treatment Center or the Minnesota Security Hospital after they no longer uh, re uh, need the services provided through those facilities. Under the budget, eligibility for this initiative expands to people at state-operated community behavioral health hospitals and people who are hospitalized, civilly committed, or wait on waiting lists for AMRTC or the CBHHs. 
There's a, a significant focus on vulnerable adults. Uh, this is a shared responsibility between both uh, the Minnesota Department of Health and the Department of Human Services. Vulnerable adults have the right to live in dignity, free from harm, and to receive high quality care. The proposals in the budget for One Minnesota work to ensure safe environments and services for vulnerable adults and encourage people to report suspected maltreatment or abuse. Minnesota's Office of the Ombudsman for Long-Term Care is significantly understaffed compared to similar offices in other states. The ratio of beds per ombudsman in Minnesota is currently 9,000 to 1 compared to a national average of 2,500 to 1. Governor Walls is proposing a $1.9 million investment in 2021 and carried on into the tails to allow the office to hire more staff to independently advocate for more vulnerable adults facing issues, including abuse. This will also help the office handle more cases involving systemic problems affecting multiple clients. The governor's budget includes measures to also improve the coordination of civil and criminal investigations to better protect vulnerable adults. The proposals accomplish this by expanding county grants and adding new tribal grantees and improving Minnesota Adult Abuse Reporting Center operations to allow timely, accurate notification to law enforcement. This requires an investment of $4 million in 2021 and, a, and an additional 5.4 in the tails. Assisted living is a fast-growing option for older Minnesotans who want accessible residences with services to help them live semi-independently. There are appro uh, approximately 1,700 registered housing with services settings in Minnesota, but data on the quality of these services is not easily accessible to the public. Governor Walls recommends 1.7 million investment in 2021 and 1.5 million investment in the tails to create an assisted living consumer and family survey process and a resulting report card to establish regular reporting on the quality of care in assisted living and registered housing with service providers. DHS is only able to conduct on-site reviews of home and community-based service facilities currently uh, every 4.8 years on average. The budget for One Minnesota includes a budget neutral proposal that will help DHS con conduct reviews every three years, ensuring timely responses to license violations, appeals of licensing actions, and provider requests for technical assistance. These changes are also necessary to meet federal waiver requirements. Increased demand for adult day centers, daycare centers has led to significant concerns for the health and safety of the people served by these facilities. Governor Walls is recommending investing in additional support to the adult day center licensing activity. This proposal will allow DHS licensing staff to conduct on-site reviews of licensed adult day centers at least once every two years and heightened monitoring and assistance to centers with compliance concerns. This is an annual investment of $135,000. Long-term services and supports, uh, Minnesota's population is rapidly aging. The state demographer projects that by next year, there will be more Minnesotans over the age of 65 than school children for the first time ever in our history. Additionally, more and more older adults and people with disabilities are choosing to live in their own homes or in community settings. We need to make investments now to meet the needs of our state's residents who require long-term services and supports. Over 47,000 Minnesotans with disabilities live, work, and engage with their community with supports from our four disability home and community-based service waiver programs administered by DHS counties and tribes, but the system is complex and difficult to understand. Based on recommendations from the 2018 Waiver Reimagine Project, Governor Walls is proposing changes that will, will consolidate the program into two waivers and streamline services available to enhance resources available to people receiving services and their families as they plan for their services and their lives. This proposal invests $2.85 million in 2021 and will generate a net savings of nearly $5 million in 22-23. The budget for One Minnesota also includes an investment of nearly $18 million for 2021 and $65 million in the tails to bolster Minnesota's direct support 
workforce. Minnesota has about 135,000 people in direct support professions and will need an additional 68,000 in the coming years to meet service demands. However, the average wage paid to direct support professionals is significantly lower than the average wage of workers in competing op uh, occupations. This proposal increases compensation for direct support professionals delivering wavered services, thereby attracting and retaining more of these staff and expanding people's access to the needed services and supports. It also ensures rate formulas keep pace with changing labor and business costs by incorporating more frequent inflationary adjustments. Governor Walls recommends a series of modifications to the nursing facility value-based reimbursement program as well, including more effective pay for performance in the reimbursement system and paying for higher quality care, as well as modifying the rate of spending growth to the Medicaid forecasted budget. The proposal also makes the property rate setting system simpler, more transparent, more equitable, and more supportive of incentives to maintain or invest in buildings. This is expected to generate an aggregate $68 million in savings over the four-year budget horizon presented. Last month, the state completed negotiations for a new contract with the self-directed workers represented by SEIU. The budget includes increased wages and benefits as well as additional funding for training for direct support professionals to meet obligations under this new contract at an investment of $36 million in 2021 and $38 million in 2022-23. Uh, direct care and treatment is also a focus in the, in the budget, supporting Minnesotans with behavioral health needs and developmental disabilities as they strive to live full, integrated lives in their communities lies at the heart of DHS's direct care and treatment facilities. To keep our safety net strong and communities safe, Governor Walls has advanced several proposals for the 2021 biennium. The Minnesota Sex Offender Program proposals provides specific funding for community preparation services as well as supervision and monitoring of civilly committed sex offenders who are provisionally discharged. In the past, Minnesota Sex Offender Program has covered these costs with other program funds that are simply no longer available. In addition, the proposal would allow MSOP to charge counties the 25% of the cost of care for clients that courts have provisionally discharged to live in communities under MSOP's supervision. The Minnesota State Operated Community Services, MSOC's proposal provides an operational adjustment to continue residential and vocational services for approximately 1,100 people with disabilities. The programs continue to focus on serving more challenging clients for which no other providers are willing or able to serve. In addition, DHS operates four intensive residential treatment service facilities, ERTS facilities, located in Brainerd, Wadena, Wilmer, and St. Paul for people with mental illness who may also have a co-occurring traumatic brain injury or other neurocognitive conditions. Currently, these facilities are budgeted to operate at an average of 12 treatment beds, but they're licensed for 16, and this proposal allows each facility to operate at its full 16-bed licensed capacity. It also simplifies the funding structure, reducing needless complexities for their operation, and results in an aggregate savings. Systems modernization is also a, a core principle. Right now, Minnesota lacks a single comprehensive point of entry for people who need access to human services. Additionally, counties, tribal nations, providers, and DHS st uh, staff struggle with antiquated IT systems, which significantly limit the time they can devote to serving and addressing client needs. A modern service delivery system would help provide access to holistic, person-centered programs that address families' unique needs. That Governor Tim Wall's budget requests $20 million for 2021 in general fund resources to support foundational efforts and for eligible activities, every $10 spent of state funds is able to live, leverage an additional $27 to $35 million in federal funds. We understand that program integrity is always a, a strong concern and Minnesotans expect and deserve state government that works efficiently and effectively. Our state government should serve citizens well and be accountable to hardworking Minnesotans. Outdated laws and regulations or poorly designed systems too often result in services that fall short of citizens' expectations. 
The Walls-Flanagan budget places renewed emphasis on improving the integrity of the systems that care for some of Minnesotans most, Minnesota's most vulnerable citizens. Non-emergency medical transportation offers the safest, most appropriate, and cost-effective mode of transportation to routine medical appointments for many people on medical assistance. However, federal and state regulators have found that many of the rides are improperly documented or fail to match up with a service that justifies the ride. Governor Walz's budget pr uh, proposal contains ongoing audits of non-emergency medical transportation, including a review of driver documentation, confirmation of medical appointments, and confirmation of distance traveled, as well as creating alignment in how DHS enrolls providers to ensure consistency and follow a similar process used with other providers, such as PCAs. This res will result in $3 million in savings over the 20 to 23 two bienniums. The budget for One Minnesota also includes the addition of four investigators to the Surveillance and Integrity Reviews section in the Office of the Inspector General, which investigates medical assistance fraud. <laughs> it also funds a case tracking system, which is already utilized by the State Bureau of Criminal Apprehension to track and report on child care assistance investiga investigation activities. But DHS isn't the only one that needs invest investments to improve program integrity. Funding for the Fraud Prevention Investigation Grant Program has been stagnant for a number of years, preventing our county uh, partners statewide from expanding their eligibility fraud investigations, including for cash, food, child care, and health care benefits. Governor Walz's proposal increases grant funding and staff for county investigations to ensure we expand this important part of the work. And finally, the federal government will soon require some care providers to use electronic visit verification systems to document that people are actually receiving the services we're paying for. Governor Walls recommends implementing electronic visit verification within Minnesota by giving providers the option of using their own approved visit verification system or using a state contracted system. This approach includes both a state approved electronic visit, visit verification system and a single statewide data aggregator. This will reduce inappropriate service payments due to record keeping inaccuracies, administrative errors and fraud, as well as ensure financial stability of the care services. There's also uh, federal compliance, technical changes, and additional needs incorporated within this budget. The budget for One Minnesota includes human services proposals to meet the federal compliance, technical changes, and other needs. Minnesota is currently one of only four states out of compliance with a federal rule to ensure that pharmacy reimbursements more accurately reflect what pharmacies pay to acquire and dispense drugs, risking the potential loss of an estimated $190 million per year in federal matching funds if the state remains out of compliance. Governor Walz's budget includes a proposal to bring Minnesota into compliance with the outpatient pharmacy rule, avoiding this potential penalty. Additionally, Governor Walls recommends simplifying the reimbursement formula for certain durable medical equipment products that don't have a Medicare rate to ensure the state pays a fair and predictable and efficient rate. This will prevent the administrative burden and financial insecurity of having to recover overpayments from providers, as well as bring Minnesota into compliance with federal reimbursement rates. And finally, the budget includes community supports, deaf and hard of hearing services, health care, and better government proposals that help DHS accomplish our mission to help people meet their basic needs so they can live in dignity and achieve their highest potential. With that, um, we'll go into just the budget overview and the, the total spending. Altogether, these proposals represent an all funds impact of $274 million in fiscal 20 to 21 which is an increase of 0.68% over our base spending. The, the breakdown is uh, the One Care Package is a $4 million investment. Child Care Investments and Integrity is a $42 million investment. Children and Families, $58.6 million. Behavioral Health Services, $33.5 million. Vulnerable Adults, $7.9 million. Long-Term Services and Supports, $45 million. Direct care and treatment, 11.2 million. Systems modernization, 20 million. Program integrity, 936,000. And federal compliance and technical changes and other needs, $850,000. So that's the uh, 80,000 foot 
um, presentation of the budget. With that, we'll, we're going to jump into the one Minnesota Care package with just a little bit more detail. But again, I will stress we will be available to discuss these in, in more detail over the coming uh, weeks and months. So for One Care Minnesota, too many Minnesotans lack affordable and comprehensive health coverage options. According to MDH Health Care Access Survey, Minnesota saw one of the largest one-time increases in the number of people without insurance between 2015 and 2017, rising from a 4.3% uninsured to 6.3%, leaving approximately 349 Minnesotans without health care coverage. One Care Minnesota offers a multi-pronged, measured approach to give more people access to comprehensive coverage, to stabilize the individual market, to address rising health care costs, and improve access to care and the health care experience for Minnesotans. The proposal leverages the state's purchasing power to negotiate better prices for prescription drugs, which are currently driving up health care spending. It also addresses oral health disparities across the state, especially in greater Minnesota. This section also includes a proposal to repeal the sunset of the provider tax to ensure a stable funding source for health care for more than one million Minnesotans that rely on medical assistance in Minnesota care. Encompassed in the One Care Minnesota is a health insurance uh, buy-in. This proposal creates a comprehensive approach to ensure Minnesotans have access to high quality health care by addressing rising costs, increasing access to care, providing comprehensive coverage, and encouraging stability in the individual market. The proposal will, start, will create a platinum level buy-in product available in the individual market for plan year 2023. It will provide access to silver and gold level buy-in products for any region of the state where the market fails to offer affordable or comprehensive health care coverage options. It will provide the necessary resources to analyze options to ensure affordable premiums and stabilize the individual market, including a study on risk adjustment. Uh, it's, it's good to note that providers will be paid no less than Medicare rates uh, on these products. It will take about six FTEs to, to build out this uh, health insurance option. Encompassed in the One Minnesota Care is also a pharmacy proposal that to establish a uniform system for managing pharmacy benefits across all MA Minnesota Care and buy-in products in order to reduce prescription drug prices and ensure access to a comprehensive pharmacy benefit statewide. This one will require two FTEs to implement. There's a One Care Minnesota Dental uh, package as well that will restructure payments and administration of dental benefits across medical assistance, Minnesota Care, and buy-in products to support providers and, increase, uh, and to increase and ensure access to dental services for Minnesotans closer to their homes. This will take one FTE to put this one together. And the entire One Care package, so the buy-in options, the pharmaceutical, and the dental package together invest $4 million in 2021 and $142 million in 2022-23. The more, majority is covered by the Health Care Access Fund, and of this cost, the general fund investment is $630,000 in 2021 and $9.4 million in 2022-23. These investments are largely one-time startup costs and, uh, and establish a reserve. Beyond this, consumers will pay for the products through premiums without additional state support. <laughs> Lastly, on my slides is the provider tax sunset repeal. This would restore the 2% provider rate increase that offsets the cost of the provider tax for MA and Minnesota Care Services. The cost of this rate adjustment is covered out of the Health Care Access Fund and invests $43 million in 2021 and 83 million. Point eight million in 22-23, and of course the health care uh, provider tax would contribute uh, $993 million to the health care access fund over the 2021 biennium. With that, um, I think we're going to turn it over to some of the um, uh, assistant commissioners and deputy commissioners to step through some more of the details in the budget, and I look forward to further engagement uh, with all of the members of your committee. 
Thank you very much, Commissioner. We we appreciate the quick overview. There's a lot here, and I there's um, a lot. Yes. Yes, there is, and uh, <laughs> there always is because it's a big department and it does a lot of very important things. And I I just want to say, you know, whether members agree or disagree with individual proposals, I really want to thank you and your everybody who works at DHS for putting this together. I think you've probably done it in record time here, and um, I really look forward to working with all of the folks in the agency as we move forward on this. And so members, for those of you who weren't here right at the beginning, um, Commissioner Lowry isn't gonna take questions now. However, we will have presentations from other, uh, with more detail from other members of his team and those folks will take questions and we will have an opportunity later on to ask questions of the commissioner and he will make himself available as he said. But these, today is an overview so I just want to be clear, you know, again, all of these things come forward as bills and we will have a lot of opportunity to ask questions and engage in the specifics. So um, thank you very much, Commissioner Lori. And we do have a quorum. Um, and so I would entertain a motion to approve the minutes of February 20th. So moved. Um, Representative Neuer moves the minutes of February 20th. And um, any discussion to the minutes? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, no. And the minutes are approved. Thank you, members. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Um, so with that, I think uh, Mr. Johnson is coming up and, and uh, Ms. Wilson, Deputy Commissioner Johnson and Deputy Commissioner Wilson. Welcome to the committee. And um, so members, as we've done before, I will repeat what we'd like to do. As you know, there's a lot of material to get through. We'd like to give them an opportunity to, to present sections of their uh, presentation. And, and if, if, you, uh, if the presenters would let us know when you've reached the end of a section where we can take questions on that <coughs> section, we've found that's a pretty expeditious way to get through things. Um, and so members, if you wanna, you can certainly raise your hand during the presentation, get on the list but please just jot down your questions, unless it's something that you need immediately in order to understand what's being said. Okay, so with that, and um, Representative Grunhagen, you had a question now. Did you wanna, before I, we get started? I was for Commissioner Laurie, but I can wait. Okay. Um, it wasn't a clarification, it was an actual question. Okay, well thank you, Representative Grunhagen, and you might have come in after I announced that at the beginning that we weren't gonna do that in this hearing, but oh. if the same topic arises, you could certainly ask one of the deputy commissioners, right. and Commissioner Lori did say that he's happy to engage with members. He's not trying to avoid the questions; it just wasn't uh, for today. So, did he um, leave the room? No. So, <laughs> just kidding. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Johnson or Ms. Wilson, oh. who's going to start? Uh, Madam Chair, I will. My name is right. Claire Wilson. I'm a, the Deputy Commissioner at the Department of Human Services. And I just also briefly want to say before I start, you know, of course, so much work goes into the putting together a budget of this size. But as I look around this room, I just think about all of the community engagement that has gone into this work. And all of you who have been in discussion with us, who have accommodated our weird hours in terms of when we call for stakeholder engagement and have been an ongoing both both pushing and um, pulling us along in this process. And so um, a, just a great shout out to the community that has been a part of this process. And um, I'm sure for all of those watching at home as well. This um, We hope that as we move this forward and implement this, we do this in partnership as well so that we can get to the best outcomes for our program participants. Um, and so with that, we're gonna start um, talking about our child care investments and integrity in that area. And as uh, Commissioner Lori sort of teed up, these are several proposals which are looking at increasing quality and program integrity in the child care assistance program. Now there's been a lot of discussion about the child care assistance program. So I think most of you are familiar with how it functions. But I do want to remind people that, you know, there's about 15,000 households who participate in the program, about 30,000 children. And of that, over 65% of those are children of color. 
So I just want to say that as we work on these programs, there we are doing a lot to try to prepare these kids for school, to allow parents to work, and that it plays a really important role in assuring that we are eliminating some of the disparity gaps for kids later in life, particularly in terms of their education. So. Both of these proposals that I'm going to touch on right now, they're on pages 35 to 41 if you're following along, um, build on some of the work that was done in 2017 to bring us into compliance with the Child Care Development Block Grant. And these are aimed at assuring that there is stability in the program, that there is access to the program, and like I said, that it brings us um, into compliance. So specifically, it fully implements 12-month eligibility, so assuring that there isn't any break for a child during the year in their access to child care. It creates an expedited application process for families who are experiencing homelessness. It expands due process rights for providers and assures that they have the appeal rights for all adverse actions. It also meets some federal health and safety requirements for out-of-state providers. So this section, which again is really aimed at sort of the program quality, invest about 8.2 million in 2021 and 20.9 in uh, the next biennium. Uh, the next, the next proposal also moving us towards compliance is updating our CCAT maximum rates. So we are, to be in compliance, rates should be updated based on the most recent market survey. However, rates have not been updated since, the 20, since 2014. So this will increase our maximum rates to, 20, to the 25th percentile of the market. So it would be based on, it would be an update in September based on the 2018 market survey and then again in 2021 based on that market survey and it would move the market survey to every three years. This would increase, um, would it clearly increase rates um, and would impact um, close to 70 to 80 percent of the families served in the program. So that is an investment of 9.4 million in the first biennium and 90.6 million in the next. There is also a need to assure that children have consistent and stable access to child care and that, that that access is also equitable across the state. So this proposal provides additional funding to the basic sliding fee child care program to buy down any waiting list in counties where there are where there is currently a wait list. And so this would serve an additional 1,000 families through that to this program and like I said would be targeted to counties and tribal agencies where there is currently a wait list. Um, this invests 26, a little under, oh sorry. No, I was just going to say Ms. Wilson, if you could just keep orienting us to the page you're oh, on. Oh, of that course. Would be really helpful. So it's, it's right up there on the top right hand corner of the slide but I will keep saying it. So this is, oh, yeah. I hope these page numbers correspond with your books, do they not? So um, the elimination of the basic sliding fee wait list is pages 39 through 41. Thank you. Are we good? Sorry. No, no, I'm sorry. I'll make sure I do it at the start of each one. So now we are going to move to pages 42 through 45. And the, this, of course, um, is responsive to much of what we've heard um, around the necessity to ensure that there are the right controls in the CCAP program. And so this is building on previous integrity measures that have been passed by the legislature and, of course, is addressing concerns that have been raised around um, the integrity of the program. This proposal really aims to increase transparency and assure that providers understand what, the, what, the, um, what it requires to meet financial and administrative integrity. So it has a couple of different components. It includes enhancing attendance record keeping requirements, so assuring that providers know when and how long they're supposed to keep records and when they're supposed to provide them. Clarifying absent day billing requirements, so when providers can bill for days when there's absences. Establishing a method for calculating attendance record overpayments. Um, allowing a penalty when providers fail 
to report decreases in attendance. So if they're, you know, failing to, to provide the necessary information around how frequently the children are attending and then the corresponding authorization for hours. And then limiting retro eligibility for the families from six months to three months. And this brings us further into alignment with some of our other programs, particularly in our, in our healthcare area where retroactive eligibility is limited to three months. Because of these integrity measures, this, this proposal does produce a savings of 1.9 million in the first biennium and 2.5 million in the second biennium. So next we're gonna talk a little bit more about the health and well-being of our families through um, our child welfare initiatives. And again, really wanting to ground in how important it is that these initiatives are addressing the well-being of children um, through culturally appropriate services and assuring that we are really addressing how we can best serve families in crisis. So, um, the first proposal that I will be speaking to is on pages 46 through 48. Okay, and um, Deputy Commissioner, I just, um, I, I know we're, we're moving through really fast. I didn't see any questions, but I, that would have been maybe a good point oh, at which sure. to see if there were any on what we just discussed. And so I want to give people an opportunity. Representative Loeffler. Um, thank you. I was really heartened to see language that talked about eliminating the waiting list for basic speed. Um, sliding uh, child care and but then I saw something else that said it would reduce it by a thousand I think we have two, about 2,000 families on it and boy it'd be really great if we could get to a point where we eliminated the waiting list um, for families um, and can you just clarify what you're really expecting as an impact deputy Wilson Madam Chair, Representative Loeffler, yeah, so what this proposal does, you're right, there's probably a few over a thousand on the wait list currently. Um, it does buy down the wait list, so it does not necessarily eliminate it completely. I believe complete elimination would be really difficult to achieve since it is, you know, a first come first serve program. Not everyone will always necessarily be served, but also, you know, we don't know exactly what the need is for in terms of the wait list because there's not always an ability to tell who, you know, leaves because there's a wait list or doesn't, you know, come back to access. But this is intended to buy down the wait list that is currently in front of us. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, if you share that goal, um, I think Representative Moran has a bill to add it to the forecast and you might want to look at that. All right. Um, Representative Franson. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to remind the body um, that there is an OLA report that will be coming out sometime soon regarding the integrity issues within the CCAP program, the fraud that's taking place. So before we talk about putting more money into the program, we really need to get a handle on the fraud within. Um, taxpayers are not exactly excited about adding more money into this program when there's accusations of of the fraud, right? And that, um, as a reminder as well, that our department spent up, the Department of Human Services spent upward of $90,000 to investigate the employees within the OIG who were investigating the fraud. So FYI, our government is uh, a little crooked. Representative Monson. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to clarify that um, the, the changes that you're proposing for the CCAP uh, program is to bring some more accountability to the to the child care providers so that if they fail to report a change in the hours that they're that the children are, are uh, that the, the hours that they're serving children then they'll be hit with a, a fine or is it uh, what, what's the what's the policy there and why aren't the providers just reporting the actual hours that they're billing Ms. Wilson uh, Madam Chair, Representative, yes. So this does um, allow that um, any date where a child was present and it was or was not present and the day was billed for it would be considered an overpayment, and there would be uh, a collection of that. And, and Representative Munson, but you're asking the providers to self-report when those change. They just report the children that are visiting them, and then the, the money the money starts and uh, doesn't stop or change until they self-report that the hours are changed? There isn't like a time card they have to turn in for billable hours? Ms. Wilson. 
Madam Chair, Representative, yes, this clarifies that they must mark in their billing records the attendance. Okay. All right, thank you. Okay. All right, please continue. Sure. Thanks, Representative Liam Ling. And I apologize for not breaking there. I was just gonna cover all of the all of the children. So now we will we'll just move on to child welfare. Um, and the first proposal we'll touch on is um, economic stability for families. So pages 46 through 48. Um, and this does, this is the increase to the MFIP grant. And, you know, I, we talked about, the commissioner talked about how there has not been an increase since 1986. I think it is good to remember that the program is serving um, over 90,736 people last year, and that 70% of those were children, and 81% of those were adults. Now, the annual earned income limit for a family of three to receive MFIP is just over $26,000 a year. And if you also think about the fact that they are getting, so some families are getting, many are getting the, uh, the grant for housing assistance, so that would bring them from a 532 rate to about 632. Um, the HUD fair market value for a two bedroom apartment um, in 1986 was $432. The HUD fair market rate value for a two bedroom apartment in today is just over $1,100. So really to assure that families have some ability to even move closer to moving out of poverty, um, it would be necessary for there to be some kind of increase in this grant, so or in MFIP. So this um, does recommend a $100 um, increase. Uh, next will be on pages 49 through 43, and this is addressing changes to the child welfare program, and um, and really that this is twofold. The first proposal that we'll talk about is really focused on thinking about the workforce and really how we can assure that we have the most trained workforce working within the system. Um, you know, I can't think of a workforce that you wouldn't want more trained than one that is in very high stress situations, making very, very difficult decisions, and who are really, you know, contemplating grappling with very high caseloads. Um, you know, as there has been an increased demand and increased out of home placement, there has been increasing pressures on the workers who have been hired to work within the child welfare system. So this proposal addresses that and addresses the high workforce turnover um, by establishing a child welfare training academy. So this would be administered jointly by the state of Minnesota and the University of Minnesota. And you know, it would really assure that the training is keeping pace with the workforce. And then, um, you know, right now we know that people start and they're, they're required to have training within the first six months. That doesn't always happen. We want to make sure that we are uh, assuring that people get the right level of training at the right time. Um, and then also assuring that because of the high level of children of color and American Indian children who are in out-of-home placement, that the training addresses culturally um, supportive services. So the Child Welfare Training Academy would invest, uh, would require an investment of $4.2 million in fiscal year 2021 and 5.8 in 22-23. And that does include additional staff to be able to provide those trainings. Uh, the second piece of uh, this proposal that we'll address is just really assuring that the state is building up the infrastructure to be responsive to the federal requirements around the Family First Prevention Services Act. So, you know, the purpose of this act is to ensure that families have an enhanced support to prevent foster care placement and out-of-home placements, and also to assure that there's the right provision of substance abuse and mental health services. Now, the challenge here is that, you know, some of the funding is going to go to some of these upstream services, and we also need to assure that our residential continuum is prepared for that and that we have the right level of services for, in, for children and their families. So this, pro this proposal will prepare the state to both take advantage of this opportunity and also to mitigate risk to the extent necessary. The next proposal I'm gonna touch on is, you can find on pages 54 through 58. 
and this is really addressing what is probably one of the most egregious statistics that will be quoted in this budget, and that is that American Indian children are 18 and a half times more likely to be placed in foster care than white children. And in 2008, uh, the state began the process of transfer transferring some of the child welfare activities to tribes um, in order for them to be able to provide these services. Um, and uh, at that point, Leech Lake and White Earth became part of the tribal initiatives. This proposal supports the expansion to Red Lake and to the Mille Lacs Band of Ojibwe and really builds on the success that we've seen with the other tribal initiatives. So at White Earth, um, just, just one thing to call out is that in the last, that their uh, moms program, which addresses opioid um, use in women and pregnant and parenting moms, uh, prevented 144 placements in the last 18 months. So it's really critical that the state think about how the provision of these services and that children are able to access them and communities are able to provide them um, in, in the ways that is appropriate uh, for the tribes. And so this program also, or this proposal also establishes the American Indian Family Early Intervention Program, which also enables grantees to provide culturally appropriate early intervention services to American Indian children and their families. This is an investment of nine million in fiscal year 2021, and um, a little over 18 and a half in the, in the next biennium. I should also note that the tribal initiatives, much like the counties, are under a lot of increased pressure given the increased caseloads and out-of-home placements, and that uh, Leech Lake and, and White Earth are also, you know, have proposals moving forward to support stabilization of their programs. And, and the final uh, proposal directly related to child welfare is the um, is a proposal that will close some gaps in health care coverage for children in the uh, in the North Star foster care and kinship care programs. So as Commissioner Laurie said, children are automatically eligible for Medicaid if they meet the Title IV-E requirements. Um, but only 44% of children in foster care and 31% qualify through this uh, mechanism, but most children are eligible for Medicaid, whether or not they're eligible for Title IV-E. So this just assures that they have streamlined access to Medicaid and uh, assures that they're not caught up in any admin administrative burden of becoming enrolled so that there's seamless coverage for those children. Because so many of the children are already eligible, it's a, it's a, it's a fairly modest investment for a very positive outcome. So it invests 363,000 in fiscal year 2021 and 1.8 million in fiscal year 22-23. And that would be an appropriate place to stop for a few questions. Okay, uh, Representative Moran has a question. Thank you um, for your pres Thank you for your presentation, Deputy um, Wilson. Um, so I want to reference the, the child welfare part of your presentation and the, the training portion too. Um, because, yes, it is Native Americans and African-American kids who are disproportionately being impacted by out-of-home placement. And I was just reading through your equity and inclusion piece of, um, of the training where, you would, uh, you, uh, where it speaks about um, considering implicit and explicit biases in the works of um, child protection workers. Um, which I, I, I think is good, and, but I also think the academy is, is much needed. You know, we've had so many child protection workers who have left the field because the, the work is, um, they've been inundated with caseloads and feeling unappreciated and it's just so much. Uh, but we also have new child protection workers coming into the system who have not been trained. And that could be a part of why so many more kids have been pulled out of their homes. So having that cultural, uh, having that uh, implicit and explicit bias training, I think is important. But I was also wondering, as you look at the training academy, have you, uh, have you um, thought about looking at 
uh, it through a more strength based lens and uh, a training that would include maybe some trauma informed policies and practices. Ms. Wilson. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative Moran, there are, um, I, I, don't, I can't speak to if, they're, if they've exactly, you know, drilled down yet to the entirety of the curriculum, but it, there will be consultation ongoing with different stakeholder groups, including cultural groups. And, um, and it is, you know, it is assuring that we are working on informing how to build out the system in a responsive way. So we can get back on if there will be more specific trauma-informed care, but as the university, you know, continues to build out the curriculum, I am, I am fairly certain because of the basis of generational trauma for so much of this that that will be considered. All right, thank you. Moran. Thank you. All right. All right. Um, mm -hmm. I think you can continue. Great. So this next group of proposals directly addresses the Minnesota, our behavioral health system. And uh, there has been a lot of conversation, of course, also recently about the behavioral health crisis in this state and about the need to strengthen our, our continuum of care. And these proposals really are looking at addressing the sustainability in the system and targeting where we see specific gaps. So the first proposal that I will be speaking to is on pages 67 through 69, and this is expanding and strengthening our school link mental health grants. So these grants are really sort of the definition of right service, right time. They are mental health services provided to children by mental health providers in the schools. This increase in the grant funding will allow us to serve an additional 7,000 children. It also allows us for more training and capacity building within the schools and allows for some of these services to be delivered by telemedicine where we are dealing with a broad geographic um, area. And then it also includes a study and an evaluation of the program because even though this program has seen great success and we have heard um, many times over that this is often children's first access to mental health services. And we know that it reduces burdens on families who do not you know, need to take their child to an appointment um, and decreases some of the stigma that comes with having to be taken out of class and taken to a behavioral health uh, you know, appointment. Um, there still needs to be some ongoing evaluation of the program and really determining how we can strengthen it and assure that um, as many kids as possible in the state are accessing those services. This does include a few additional FTEs. This entire program is currently run by one FTE who is a superwoman, um, but with an expansion, she, she will require some additional support. Um, the next proposal I'm going to speak to really addresses the continuum of services for our children and in their uh, in their intensive services. And this is pages 70 through 72. So as we've had much discussion about at the legislature, our children's residential treatment facilities, which um, have, have, that provide residential services to children with um, severe mental illness, are, have been designated as IMDs if they are over 16 beds, which means that we have lost the federal um, funding for those facilities. Um, in Minnesota, the counties pay the local share for those facilities, and so the burden um, would fall onto the counties if there was not a solution, and a solution was agreed to last year through May of this year. Um, and needs to be extended, both so that we can assure that we continue to have this capacity to serve children, but also because their ongoing coverage is dependent on assuring that they're enrolled in the right program. We also are faced with a moment in time when we realize that we are still not meeting the needs of children who require this intensive level of service. And so as the state has authorized uh, the new psychiatric residential treatment facilities and as they have come online, um, there is still the recognized need that we are not meeting the demand. So this proposal does recommend an additional 150 psychiatric residential treatment beds um, or psychiatric yeah, beds in PRTFs and it, it lifts the limit as Commissioner Lurie said on the current six sites. 
Um, this would also provide some startup funding for um, for providers as they move into the into providing these services. So this invests 12 million in fiscal year 2021 and just about 23 and a half in the next biennium. The next pages are 73 through 76, and this is the Certified Community Behavioral Health Clinic expansion. So the Certified Community Behavioral Health Clinics, or CCBHCs, are currently operating under a federal demonstration program. And these are clinics that are providing what's kind of been coined as a one-stop shop for behavioral health services. So they're providing mental health services, SUD treatment, and some primary care services rooted in community mental health, so really rooted with providers who um, are very experienced in providing services to people who are experiencing mental illness. We have seen some incredible outcomes just in the last two years around increased access and people being served by this model. In fiscal year 18, over 17,000 children and adults received the services through a CCBHC. So this proposal transitions this from a demonstration project to an ongoing service model within Minnesota's continuum of mental health and substance use disorder treatment. This is expected to result in five additional clinics becoming CCBHCs during this period. And this, um, this proposal also recommends some funding to allow those provi providers to start up. The Federal Demonstration Project um, provided some startup funding, recognizing that this is a large shift in the way that services are delivered. And it also provides some funding for ongoing um, continuous improvement and data evaluation, as this is a relatively new model of care in our continuum of services. This invests 3.9 million in 2021 and 22.4 million in 2022-23. As we continue to talk about disparities, I do, and focus on um, the opioid crisis, I do think it's important to note that Minnesota still remains number one in terms of overdose deaths um, in the American Indian community. Um, and that is something that the state is proposing to address in, the, in a variety of ways. One is to provide uh, grants to tribes and to the urban Indian communities that are specific to cultural healing. And this, so this would support both the uh, practice and increasing the capacity to provide the practice and invest um, in, in, a, in an additional staff within the department who would be able to monitor these grants and continue to research how these practices are being funded in other states and where some models for sustainability might lie. Um, as part of addressing the opioid crisis, we are the governor is also proposing that we utilize the, the screening um, brief intervention and referral to treatment, or the ESPERT, as a mechanism to authorize services. So as you all know, so frequently when someone comes to access an assessment uh, and then is assessed to require treatment, there is a wait list for services. So this brief screening allows for a small set of services to be authorized immediately so that people could access care coordination or peer support services while they um, wait either for additional treatment or a comprehensive assessment. And then finally, the governor is also proposing the establishment of an opioid stewardship advisory council. So this would be the council advising the dollars that would be generated through the opioid stewardship fee. And this council would be tasked with really taking a look at, a, at what is necessary for a comprehensive comprehensive statewide response to the opioid crisis. Um, and it would also provide additional investments to county and tribal social service agencies to support child protection activities within communities most impacted by this crisis. And that proposal invests 12.4 million in 2021 and 16 and a half in 22-23. Pages 86 through 89 of your book address the mental health uniform service standards. So this, this proposal is directly addressing the challenge of the fact that so many of our mental health services operate under different regulatory frameworks. So some of the services are licensed, 
some are certified, and it creates a lot of overlap for providers who are providing this you know, set of services. And it also just creates a lot of complex um, administrative burden um, and lack of you know, sort of ease in terms of navigation for people trying to navigate services. So this proposal is aligning our standards across these services and really directing the department to start to look at uh, moving these services all into a similar regulatory framework. And this, you know, the hope here is really that this will increase access while increasing accountability through a new regulatory framework. Because this is a very big lift for these service, for this, you know, for this continuum of care, and we have been working with our stakeholders, this will direct us to be, continue to do this work. It will direct more stakeholder engagement and begin to build up the capacity within the agency to move towards this new regulatory framework. Um, however, one service that will immediately see some of its standards aligned are our mobile crisis services, so that we are assuring as those expand statewide, you know, um, that we have them under the appropriate, that they have the appropriate standards and statute. Moving to pages 90 through 93, this is continued focused effort. So we've been talking about integrated services. We've been talking about the regulatory environment. You know, another challenge that faces the behavioral health system is that there is not alignment around the financing mechanisms. So mental health is financed in certain ways. SUD services are financed in certain ways. And neither of them are totally on par with the way in which healthcare is financed. So this is moving us closer to alignment between these two service lines by assuring that we are strat employing strategies that really leverage um, the common financing mechanisms. So as, as Commissioner Lori said, this will eliminate the county share for SUD services and incent enrollment in Medicaid, since most of those services are um, are eligible to be financed through through our Medicaid program. And then it also takes um, and provides for presumptive eligibility for housing supports for individuals who are in either behavioral health or are in behavioral health treatment, so either mental health treatment or an SUD treatment. And this is directly aimed at addressing the challenge of people being discharged from treatment and going into homelessness and then re-entering treatment. So the hope is that that presumptive eligibility for housing supports allows a more streamlined access to supportive housing from treatment. And then finally, it aligns the ways in which room and board are paid for um, when these services are utilized. So when an individual is receiving SUD treatment, their room, residential treatment, their room and board is covered through the, cons, uh, the um, CCDTF. When you are receiving treatment in a mental health residential treatment facility, your room and board is paid through through the housing supports program, which is a program that you have to, you know, you know, contribute a part of your income to and become enrolled in. So this would align the ways in which those two uh, those two continuums of care pay for room and board, and mental health treatment would be paid for through a room and board rate, similar to to the way that it is funded in SUD. Um, and then this, of course, also contains the what we referred to as the CCDTF admin swap last session, where we're moving um, some of the administrative costs from the department from the CCDTF into the general fund. And Deputy Commissioner, could you please, uh, I, I know, I just suspect some members might not know what that acronym is. Oh, sure. The Consolidated Chemical Dependency Treatment Fund. I was struggling with it there for a minute, but I got it. I know it. All right. So the next one that we're so the the final proposal that we'll talk about will not be unfamiliar to anyone who's been at the legislature for any time, but this is um, this is a proposal to directly address the problem of what's frequently referred to as flow in our mental health system. So we have individuals who are stuck in levels of care which they no longer require. So within hospitals are some of our state institutions, and there just isn't an ability to trans to transition them because of a lack lack of community capacity or just not enough resources. So the Transitions to Community Initiative uh, leverages what we refer to as the whatever it takes grants to move people from this level of care into the community. 
That, that funding is currently only available to individuals who are in AMRTC or so the Anoka Metro Regional Treatment Center or the Minnesota Security Hospital. This proposal ex would expand that funding to individuals who are in the hospital and committed um, and or who are in our CCBHs, so our community uh, behavioral hospitals. Um, and it would also expand some funding under the elderly waiver because many of these individuals are 65 and older um, who are uh, within the Anoka Metro Regional Treatment Center or other state institutions and are having difficulty um, finding community placement. So this invests 2.4 million in 2021 and 4.6 million in fiscal year 22-23. And I will remind everyone that when someone is in um, is in AMRTC and no longer meets level of care, the counties are funding those days. Um, and so really assuring that we're able to create the necessary community supports to transition people is, is critical, both for people's care um, and for the financing. That's behavioral health. Okay, <laughs> so a little pause there. You can take a breath and uh, let's see, Representative Moran. Yes, Madam, uh, Madam Chair, um, and forgive me, members, uh, if I'm still stuck a little bit here, but I've been reading a little bit more on the training academy, oh. and, and so we talked a little bit about the need for the training, and I don't see, and it's not going to be up until 2023, so I'm wondering what's going to happen between now and training child protection workers in 2023? Ms. Wilson. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative Moran, I mean, I, mean I, I actually, Nikki, do you want to, does Assistant Commissioner Farragut want to speak to that? Or is the answer just that we're continuing our training? I mean, a part of this is that we'll be continuing the training that we're already doing. And, you know, as this proposal calls out, we have very limited staff compared to other states who are providing training. So we have about 13 staff currently who are providing training. States like Colorado and Washington, Colorado has 41 FTEs who do child welfare training. Washington has 45 and Pennsylvania has 100. So as we're doing the groundwork for this academy, which includes working with the university and studying um, what it will take to measure, you know, um, caseloads, we'll, we will be continuing with our ongoing training efforts and do you want to? Oh. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> we won't let you off that or easily. <laughs> Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair, Representative Moran. My name is Nikki Farrago. I'm the Assistant Commissioner for Children and Family Services at DHS. Um, Representative Moran, to your question, the Training Academy will be fully operational in the year 2023, um, but leading up to that, we're gonna be working with the University of Minnesota to develop our infrastructure, to bring on staff to, um, to do the work and um, so there will be work happening and additional training um, that will take place prior to 2023 in the years leading up to it. Representative Moran. Madam Chair, um, so my concern is, is that we know that we have many new child protection workers coming into the system who have not been trained. Um, and, for many, and for many different reasons, I'm gonna assume, <coughs> that our kids are going down an investigation track versus an assessment track, and thus are finding themselves in out-of-home placement. And with the number of kids that we are seeing being funneled <clears throat> into out-of-home placement is very concerning. And so, uh, you know, as you work on the, the foundation or the structural piece of that, leading up to 2013, that's good, but we still have a gap here between what we're going to do now as reports have been, been made where we have a system that is, <clears throat> um, I, I would say that um, it's, it's leading a, a track where um, children have been separated from families and their community and everything they know and they've been placed into foster care, not enough kinship care. Uh, 
So, you know, it's, it's just concerning that, yes, the academy, I'm like 102% there, believing that it has to happen. But I also believe that something has to be in place now. Because I'm just reading through some of the, the, the issues, the concerns you have around the, the current training system. And so what do we do as you improve that structural piece with the U to ensure that we're doing the best that we need to do to ensure that the well-being of our kids families and communities at the forefront of what needs to happen within the child welfare system. Yeah, Ms. Farrago. Madam Chair, Representative Moran, um, I share your concern. There is a, a significant increase in out-of-home placement for children across the state. And as Deputy Commissioner Wilson noted, um, that has significantly disproportionate impacts on our African-American and American Indian families. Um, what we can do in the meantime and what we are doing is committed to working with communities um, to hear from them, as you stated earlier in your earlier question about the training, to focus on strengths, to do strengths-based training, to do um, trauma-informed approaches with our families, with our children, um, with our workers who are experiencing secondary trauma in this work. Mm -hmm. um, and to make sure that, that that's at the forefront of the conversations that we're having in this curriculum development and, and implementation. Um, and also to, to your comments about the implicit and explicit bias that we see, it is really critical for us to be focusing on those pieces because especially when we're under times of stress, we all naturally go to our defaults. And that's especially true for a social worker who is inundated with cases um, and doing really difficult work with families and children that um, they need to be able to have the space to recognize what's really going on and what, what they're bringing to the work and to be able to, to do that effectively. Thank you. So members, we have about two minutes left in this hearing. <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Johnson, it doesn't, it doesn't look like you're going to get to do your part today. But our next hearing, we will continue with the presentation. Representative Grunhagen and then Representative Baker have questions. Oh. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, yeah, the questions for uh, Deputy Commissioner Wilson. Um, thanks for your presentation. My understanding is, uh, from going through this, is a significant expa expansion of mental illness services in our schools, correct? Oh, Madam Chair, uh, one of the I understand mm -hmm. why, and I understand that we have a crisis in that area. But my concern is that uh, we have an excessive amount of labeling and drugging going on in our schools. And is the department looking at anything as far as uh, addressing this and putting some uh, parameters around it? Uh, we are at uh, between 9 and 11 percent. We all know that it's done on a subjective, not an objective basis, okay? So it's just a judgment call based upon certain uh, questions and criteria. And some of the severe consequences of psychotropic drugs on developing children are becoming more and more uh, uh, <coughs> exposed in the medical community. So I just wonder if the department has any plans to address that as they expand mental health services, because it seems like many times popping a pill is the easy solution nowadays. So Representative Grunhe, we have about one more minute here. And I think your question is um, a little bit outside the scope of what we're talking about today, but I, I bet you, I don't wanna speak for her, but I bet you that Ms. Wilson would be happy to talk with you offline, if that would be okay. And I do want to give Representative Baker a chance to ask his question as well before we would a yes break. Or no Is that answer acceptable? Would be fine. <laughs> Does it lend itself to a yes or no? Okay. Can, Ms. Wilson, will you, you can talk with Representative Grunhagen off. Okay. Madam Chair, yes. Yeah. Representative Baker. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I think um, I just want to uh, thank uh, Commissioner Wilson for her work on this again and our, our involvement over the <clears throat> past few years on addiction and, and opioids as well. I think I just want to make sure on record that we're talking about this new opioid stewardship fee and the funds and the advisory committee that we're working really hard to put together. Some of the comments that we've heard throughout some of our stops along the way have been to 
maybe question and maybe to verify that the recommendations of this advisory council, listen to from DHS, will in fact, in much large in fact, be done the way the advisory council wants it to be utilized. I think that uh, that council of really hands-on folks on the ground, really touching people that have, have, have had the real stories, the doctors that are on this, the, the uh, providers and so on, just we wanna make sure that uh, it's, in, it's in real practice, that if it's not you there at that meeting, it'll be someone that you will trust wholly, so that um, when that advisory council makes a recommendation that you will wholeheartedly, for the most part really, again, make sure that that's the way those monies should be spent. And I just, on record, with the cameras on and the microphones on, I just wanna make sure that you and I are on that same page. Ms. Wilson. Madam Chair, Representative Baker, we are on that same page. And that is why this council is comprised of the members that it is and why it is granted oversight of the funding. And I do think that as we work with that council and bring it in, you know, and as we work to assure that we're lining efforts across the agency, across the community, that it will be critical that that feedback is taken seriously. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation today. <laughs> Members, um, this book has your name on it. You are certainly welcome to bring it back to your office. You may not want to carry it around with you all day, <laughs> but I know some of you will have a hard time putting it down. It is so interesting, but you are certainly, as you see, it has a lot of detail about a lot of both current, uh, the current budget and the proposals that are being made. And so I highly recommend that you read up on the parts that interest you. And uh, with that, members, we are adjourned. Absolutely.